today we're going to start uh, with a really, really important program on an important topic for, for all of us in the room and people who are uh, beyond the room who, who maybe couldn't make it in today. So it's, it's something where we can really think about inclusivity, connectivity, uh, sustainability, empowering in the, in the urban context. So as many of you may know, but, but some may be new to us in the Tamer Center, we emerge out of a pre-existing program, and that's the Social Enterprise Program. And, and we were renamed the Tamer Center in January of 2015. And that renaming, uh, coming with that, has been a set of new initiatives. I just mentioned a couple of them. So one is the Tamer uh, Fund for Social Ventures. And that's where we provide uh, seed grants to nonprofit, for profit, and hybrid uh, early stage Columbia affiliated social ventures. And we are in the second year of that. And we're also doing uh, something called the Summer Fellowship Program, and that pairs uh, social enterprise students across the university with organizations uh, largely in the New York area who create social and environmental value. Um, if you are interested in, in those kinds of programs or the other things we do, please, please uh, go to our website um, and, and, and look at all we have to offer. We'd be lo love to have you join our community in, in, in many ways. So alongside these new initiatives, uh, we're continuing something which emerged from before we were called the Tamer Center, and that's thinking about how business can contribute to society and the environment and by emphasizing, like today, the, the role that social enterprise can play in transforming communities. Um, and that gets us to the theme for today, which is Cities Transformed, Empowering Individuals, Businesses, and Communities. And we're always forward-looking, but it's important, as we have this conversation, to think about the current challenges that social enterprise works to address. And this conference, then, it gives us an opportunity uh, to really share. Uh, students can engage with business leaders, social entrepreneurs, scholars, and one another to develop a greater understanding of the leading innovations that are changing right now our urban landscape. So uh, today you're going to hear from uh, a wide array of uh, speakers, and they're coming from ventures. Some of those ventures are newly formed. Some of them are es established, uh, all active in this in this journey to, to transform communities, um, and, and urban communities in particular. Uh, and they're going to be working across different fields. So you'll see uh, some people of FinTech and education, uh, sustainable transportation. You'll, you'll see a wide range of, of speakers. And it, it's really important because we want to think about things like social change as part of this ecosystem that involves innovation, law, the community, um, and, and really to really tackle this, this idea of transforming individuals, businesses, and communities, that kind of conversation is, is really critical. So uh, we really thank you for, for coming uh, to, to join us in this conversation. Um, while I am thanking, I want to make sure uh, and, and, and say thank you to uh, a lot of the folks who, who helped put this together. So uh, within the Tamer Center, there's uh, Diana Rambeau and uh, Hannah Slow. Um, there's also the rest of the Tamer Center. They, I don't know if they're in the room, if you are, wave your hand, but most of them are, are out and, and working at the desk in front or are on the side or, or, or backstage. But definitely thank you for all of the, the work. And a, and a big thank you for the um, uh, conference co-chairs, and that's uh, Meredith Milstein and Hilary Wool. I don't know if you could raise your hands if you're here or stand, or, um, and they may be working out in, in front as, as well. Um, as you know, for this kind of conference, it's, it's, um, it's a lot of uh, work and a lot of good deeds that go along to it, and really appreciate the way that they've helped us advance uh, this, this agenda. So. Um, um, especially given that this is a program which fits quite nicely into what we at the Tamer Center want to do, um, uh, we're especially grateful. I wanted to uh, now sort of make a transition and um, introduce the keynote speakers for, for this morning. So we are very excited, fortunate, and uh, honored. 
really to have a, a two openings uh, keynotes. And what they're going to do, they're each going to, to speak um, and then um, I have a chat at the, at, the, at the chairs. And you'll see, if you don't know, the, the, both the, what ties them together, but the unique experience is going to make for a really rich conversation. So uh, the two speakers are uh, John Paul Farmer, who's the Director of Technology and Civic Innovation at Microsoft. And the other is Andrew Salkin, who is the Senior Vice President of City Solutions at 100 Resilient Cities. So I'm going to read um, John Paul's bio and then, a and then Andrew's and then, and then turn it over to them. And then uh, that will begin this great day of, of dialogue and, and sharing that we have. John Paul Farmer is the Director, as I said, of Technology and Civic Innovation at Microsoft. He is breaking new ground in the creative application of emerging technologies through lean product prototyping and innovative public private partnerships. John and his team work to connect promising technologies to today's most pressing challenges through things like machine learning, uh, blockchain, uh, Internet of Things, things like that. Previously, John served as a senior advisor for innovation at the White House under President Obama, where he co-founded and led the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program to attract top private sector technologists and entrepreneurs for focused tours of duty in government. During his time in Washington, John architect how a startup mentality can be brought to bear on government's hardest problems. And that was to create this blueprint for uh, digital services revolution in the uh, public sector. Private, uh, prior to the U.S. government, John envisioned and built new business units in the private sector. He has experience in the technology, finance, and healthcare sectors in particular. After leaving the White House, John founded the Innovation Project, a nonprofit organization that provides advice and best practices related to government innovation worldwide. He holds an AB with honors from Harvard University and an MBA with honors from Columbia Business School. Uh, so uh, thank you to, to John for, for joining us and, and um, uh, we'll welcome him with a great round of applause when, um, um, in, in a few minutes. Um, John, um, Andrew Salkin, um, our other keynote, is the Senior Vice President of City Solutions at 100 Resilient Cities. He joined 100 Resilient Cities from New York City's Department of Finance, where he was the Deputy Commissioner of Operations, managing more than 800 people and responsible for collecting $30 billion annually through real estate business, excise taxes, and parking summonses. In this role, he improved efficiencies and customer service, including introducing web-based payment options. Previously, also, he was the, the first Deputy Commissioner of the Tax and Lu uh, Limousine Commission, overseeing day-to-day -day operations of the agency, including regulations of New York City's uh, medallion taxi fleet, library vehicles, commuter vans, and paratransit vehicles. And that comprises 50,000 vehicles and 100,000 drivers. Some of his landmark projects included equipping taxis with credit card payment machines. So you, thank you for that, Andrew. Um, and it's hard to actually do, to think of the days when that wasn't the case, but um, I do remember those days too. Um, and also uh, New York City's Taxi of Tomorrow competition. During the transit strike of 2005, he developed and oversaw the implementation of the transit strike plan that allowed for an additional a million and a half taxi rides a day. Uh, prior to joining the Taxi and Limousine Commission, Andrew worked at the Department of Transportation as Lower Manhattan Borough Commissioner, also known as uh, the, the Downtown Construction Czar. So uh, in there, he led efforts to balance the needs of residents, employees, and tourists of Lower Manhattan amidst the cleanup, construction, and rebuilding post-September 11th. He holds a Master's of Public Administration degree from Syracuse University and a Bachelor's uh, in Economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So again, first, uh, they'll each give a short presentation. Uh, they'll come up for a fireside chat afterwards. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, uh, get out of the way and uh, really allow uh, us to, 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 to gain some insights from our two great speakers. So thank you very much, uh, Andrew. All right. Um, can you all hear me? All right. Super. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Andrew Salkin, and I work at 100 Resilient Cities. And what I'm going to spend a little bit about 
talking about this morning is urban spaces, cities, and how we're working with cities around the world to help them become more resilient. So I want to help, I hope, set some of the stage for the context in which the innovations and solutions you guys are all thinking about will exist when we talk about cities. Um, cities are amazing and great places. Um, we, we, I guess we all live in one, and so we know that. They're places of amazing energy, um, there are places where culture comes together, and it's usually the hub of economic vitality in many places. And so we love cities, but cities are facing some significant, I guess you could call it, trends that could put their ability to survive in question and in doubt. One of the trends that we know about is, is urbanization across the world. In 2013, it was the first time in the world's history that more than 50% of the world's population lived in a city. Uh, that number is estimated to go up to over 70% by 2050. We also are seeing cities becoming more interconnected because of technology. They're kind of becoming closer together, but also because of their economies, they're actually reliant and more reliant on each other. And that was super apparent when we had the giant flood in Bangkok in 2011, where not only did it cause severe damage in Bangkok, but the city, um, the damage to the factories that were there had, had mass... Um, caused mass havoc to distribution systems for technology parts and car parts across the whole world, causing over $40 billion in damage throughout the world, most of it outside of Bangkok itself. So cities are more connected. And another trend is not just climate change, but cities are facing um, disruptions, greater exposure to hazards. And these hazards seem to be bigger and lasting longer than ever before. And we know when, when bad things happen in cities, it's the poor and vulnerable who are impacted at a disproportionate amount. So the world is getting uh, more people are moving into cities, cities are becoming more interconnected, and they're facing more stresses and, and, and challenges. And so that's kind of the, the reality bad news, but the good news is there's great opportunity. And we're at this wonderful opportunity where we, we know what cities are today, we have better ability to begin to think about how to organize them and partner with cities. Um, and we also know amazing amounts of investment are going to happen in cities. So we know that if you're going to have, um, if 70% of the world's population is going to live in a city, we know that m cities are going to grow. We know that we're going to need to build over a billion new homes for people to live in. We know that 65% of the infrastructure that's going to exist in urban spaces in the future, in the next, by 2050, hasn't been built yet. So some of the questions we should be asking ourselves is how do we recognize that that trend's going on really today and how do we begin to prepare for that so that what we're building today not only makes today better but also helps to ensure that what we want our cities to be in the future, they can be. And a lot of ways to think about it is the investments that we're making today are really going to impact how we're going to do that in the future. So one of the things we're doing at 100 Resilient Cities is working with 100 cities. Um, and we're really trying to give cities the space to think about what does it take for them to survive today and be the kind of city they want to be today, but really start to make the investments that's going to help them survive in the future without a really good sense of what's going to happen, right? It's an uncertain future. The kind of um, disruptions they're going to face are a little bit unknown. But how does the city organize itself? And it's not just government, but it's the entire city, that whole urban space. To help cities do that, we're providing grants to hire a chief resilience officer, which is a new position for each city. It's a senior person that's going to work um, closely with city leadership under the mayor, working across silos within government, but also working outside government, working with private sector partners, civil society, and communities to help bring thinking and solutions at, um, at a scale that is helpful to the city and helpful to the communities and the individuals that are going to help the city become who it should be and, uh, and help the city survive disruption. Um, one of the key things to doing that is we're linking cities to private sector partners, um, non, uh, non-profit sector partners who are trying to and, and working in that city space and we're trying to facilitate a conversation um, with kind of the cities that are beginning to figure out what their challenges are and with entities that are working there and linking them together in a way that hopefully facilitates an accelerated thought process and then solutioning development and then action. Um, when we work with cities, we work with this concept of resilience. And we start by introducing cities to this concept that they should think about themselves um, you know, by providing functions and essential functions to cities every day. Um, and it's these essential functions that have to be maintained 
whether you're facing something like a, a shock or facing something like a stress. And if you really start to think about it, it's not just shocks that can really take a city down. It's really these stresses. And I want to take a moment to talk about that. But both shocks and stresses can have impact on the social, on the uh, physical and economic components of a city. And you start thinking about the multiple systems that a city fa is, is, makes a city great. Those are also the systems that are under kind of duress every day. And it's our ability to begin to manage those systems and how they complement and support each other that will help drive our cities. So one of the things we talk about is helping cities understand shocks. And shocks are really easy to think about. And since we're all living in New York now, or many of us are here in New York at least, we know that a shock can have tremendous disruption. So when Superstorm Sandy came, it was very clear what happened, right? There's mass amount of damage. Lots of people lost their homes. We could see it on TV. People around the world saw the damage. That's what a shock does. What's interesting about a shock, though, is it's everybody sees the damage and everyone can kind of figure out what to do. So in many ways, government can respond very cleanly and nicely. Civil society can respond. Businesses can respond because we all can kind of say, let's water came. Let's get rid of the water. Let's get things turned back to normal. But those are the easy things. I think what's harder is the beginning to think about these stresses. And the reason I think it's worth raising these stresses today, because when you think about the innovations and the social impact that many of you are trying to have, it's about, it's about impacting these stresses. And if you all are familiar with Red Hook, um, a neighborhood in Brooklyn, right? Superstorm Sandy flooded Red Hook. But if we were really thinking strategically, we didn't need to know, we didn't need Sandy to remind us that Red Hook was a place that was, um, had lack of affordable housing, had bad access to air quality, poor access to transportation, education, and jobs. And those things are what made Red Hook a city that, uh, a neighborhood that's under stress and duress. Not because of Sandy, um, it always was there, and it's still there today. Sandy just made it a lot worse. So if you can think about how do we organize ourselves to hit these stresses and begin to manage them better, one of the partners that manage these stresses is city government. A tremendous amount of money here in New York City and cities around the world is being spent on almost every one of those stresses. You can almost replace each one of those stresses with a, a city agency. And many of the interventions that you're all thinking about probably impact some component of the stress. And it's one thing to say all this, but it becomes really hard to kind of organize and think about how are you working in the city, what are the impacts on the different systems. So we use this as a starting point, shocks and stresses, and then we use that to start talking about how do you make your city more resilient? How do you start thinking about those systems? And this is the definition that we use with our cities, which is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, and businesses, and all of the systems within a city to really survive and adapt to shocks and stresses they may face. But we don't think it's enough to just say survive and adapt. We also want you to think about thriving. And thriving is really that notion or at least for me and when I think about it, it's about how do you leverage what you're doing today to make sure you're going to become who you want to be in the future. And it's about really disrupting those systems and those equilibriums in which we exist today to make them transform into the places that we want to be tomorrow. So we start with this definition, resilience with cities. We help them understand shocks and stresses. But then the next piece is we want them to begin thinking about the different systems that make up the city. So I'm going to share something a little academic with you, but I was told you're all eager and and ready to digest this kind of stuff early in the morning. And so just to kind of set the stage for, th for the rest of the day, I thought it'd be worth getting into the city resilience framework. Um, and this is something that the Rockefeller Foundation developed with um, Arab ID. And I'm going to run through it quickly, but I, it hopefully gives a little bit of a flavor of, of what a city is and what's going on in a city in an urban space. So there's four key um, dimensions. They're really, the first one's people. The second one is kind of the organization and organizations of the city. It's the place of the city. And the last one is really this idea of how the city's leadership and knowledge is leveraged and worked through. And when you break it down, you start to get into a little bit more specific items. So it's about the people. Are you providing basic services, health, uh, sorry, water, uh, affordable housing, um, those kind of things. Are you providing jobs and livelihoods and opportunities for cities? Are you providing a health system that works not only in good times, but but also is able to, to help cities when there's, there's stress. Um, it's about the people. It's about where the people live, so their communities, right? Communities that work together and people that, neighbors that know neighbors can do amazing things in good times and in bad. That's a big, a big comment that a lot of people are talking about these days. I think that, that next one is uh, social 
stability and security is this notion of how does government show up? How is government partnering with communities? Are they providing security? Are they providing security and justice in a way that works for the community? Right? And then is government also showing up in a way that helps grow the economy? Because government can, um, I'm sorry, what, um, can foster economic prosperity or government can put up barriers and regulations to economic prosperity. How does government partner with business sector to help grow the economy? Because a, a strong economy is great for all urban places. And one of the things we want to help think about is, is how do you, how does, what are the different partners involved and how do they help complement each other and help support a more diverse and a more prosperous economy that can exist today but also into the future? A lot of people think about resilience, they think about place. So when we think about the place, um, it's not just the built infrastructure, um, but it's also how the, that infrastructure is functioning, right? We, we in New York are under the threat of aging infrastructure every day. We're under the threat of um, overtaxed transportation systems. And in fact, we had a, a shock yesterday that a lot of people in the region are having to deal with. Um, and hopefully it's the kind of tragedy that we'll see a lot less of, but likely we'll see a lot more of. Um, in addition, though, it's about understanding your, your, your natural environment. And too often in, in, in cities, you forget the important role that your natural environment plays in helping to protect you and helping to provide spaces for people to enjoy and that the, the importance of that ecosystem that gets created between the built and the natural environment. And being a good steward of that is something that I don't think cities spend enough time thinking about, but yet is so critical to the resilience. In addition, there's some key systems that are out there, and I think a lot of people are leveraging these systems for your solutions um, and, the, and the idea that you think about on transportation in particular and on telecommunications and communications and how cities leverage that is really critical. The last part, I think, is just something, again, I want to throw out there is this idea of knowledge and leadership and the ability of leaders to be transparent in decision making, the ability of them to partner with communities in meaningful ways so that the communities can actually participate in decision making or at least understand why decisions are being made, and it's how do the communities, the people of the city and the leadership come together to have a shared common vision of who their city is, and how do they have a vision that is kind of well understood by everybody, but something that everyone can actually move towards and agree on and take the necessary steps along the way to keep achieving their goals, even facing new circumstances. So this is the framework, and it's, it's really a, a great way of understanding the different systems that make up a city. And when we start thinking about the, the kind of social impact that many of us want to have, it, it's going to not just impact one part of this framework, it's going to impact multiple parts of the framework. And one of the things that we want to help cities do, and I think I want to think about this for today, and one of the things John and I will talk a lot about in our fireside chat, I anticipate, is you, know, you can't just solve one thing at one time. Right? The, I, the most successful kind of items are going to be those that solve multiple things for multiple purposes simultaneously. And the problem we have with that is that's contrary to how we're really organized, right? A lot of us are organized in these silos because it's hard and complex to do our day jobs, and it's, it's hard enough to kind of get your, your own job done, let alone start thinking about how does my job help this other job, and how does that other job help another job? And, but yet, that's the way we're going to succeed. So I put this up there as, as kind of reference for the day to think through what, how are you all showing up, how is your thinking, how are the different interventions and ideas that are being presented showing up, what is the complexity in which the environment they're working is, and how complex is that, and what, what are the barriers that the complexity um, provides and, and, and makes in their ability to actually implement and achieve kind of the change we're looking for. And often it's not the, the, the intervention that's the problem, it's the system in which the intervention's trying to play with might, that might be the problem. So I put that up there and, uh, as a basis, and I thank you for letting me share a little bit about 100 Resilient Cities and some of the thinking that we're doing around the world. I'm gonna pass this uh, clicker off to John for the next step. Thank you. Hell with the lid off. This is how they used to describe my hometown of Pittsburgh. It was a polluted city, a place where steel mills up and down the three rivers didn't just pollute the rivers, they polluted the air. There were some serious stresses that Pittsburgh as a city, as a community, had to deal with. Now, fortunately for me, when I grew up there in the 1980s, it looked a lot more like this. It was a beautiful place to live, gleaming skyline. But at the same time, at the street level, there were some serious shocks affecting Pittsburgh, 
affecting the steel industry. In just a few years, in the early 1980s, Pittsburgh lost 200,000 of the one million jobs in the area. Just think about that. 20% of the jobs gone in the blink of an eye, not coming back. A lot of the people who lost these jobs, maybe they'd saved enough money, they were able to retire. Others had to find new jobs in new industries. But a lot of the young people, a lot of the young people left. They left town for good, they didn't come back. If you want to read about this era in Pittsburgh's history, the definitive account is called And the Wolf Finally Came. It's also one of the reasons that no matter what city you're in, there's a great Steelers bar. Because people from Pittsburgh went to all corners of this country and they're still there. Now the reason that Pittsburgh at the end of the 1980s was able to actually cr produce more steel by value than it did at the height of the steel boom is because of technology. That's a big part of it. And a lot of people today, when they talk about technology, it's either the hero or the villain. And there's no in-between. But I think we all know, and if we think about it, if we're honest with ourselves, it's just a set of tools. Tools like artificial intelligence, like machine learning, like 3D printing and blockchain, like big data. These are tools that are at our disposal. And if we're not using them in the 21st century, when we think about how we make impact in our cities and our communities, then we're missing opportunities. This is the Oprah's book talk portion of this, uh, this presentation. So there are a few different, um, different books that I think provide a good framework, taken collectively, for how we think about what's going on in the world today. The first one is by Klaus Schwab. Klaus is the founder of the World Economic Forum and he wrote the fourth industrial revolution. And he talks about how the changes happening in society, the role of technology, uh, fits in, 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 uh, in with what's happened in the past. And he calls the first industrial revolution being that of mechanized engines from the 18th century. The second being electricity and mass production in the 19th century. The third, we're all familiar with, the IT era automation from the 20th century, and today, cyber physical systems in the 21st century, more commonly known as the Internet of Things. Alec Ross, Alec Ross wrote The Industries of the Future, came out this year. Alec spent four years traveling the world with then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. He was her advisor for innovation. Alec was in the meetings uh, with heads of state, but also with innovators and entrepreneurs in countries around the world. And he collected those thoughts in this book, The Industries of the Future, to showcase where we're headed, where we can, can go, what the innovative breakthrough businesses that might be small today, but could be big three, five, or ten years from now. And finally, the last of the three books is The End of Power by Moises Naim. This is probably my favorite of the three, because while the title is a bit hyperbolic, it's not actually the end of power, it's really an evolution of power, it's a change in what power means, there's never been a time in, in human history when people, individuals, and small groups have had more capabilities than they have today. Just think about what the PC, mobile devices, GPS, cloud computing, what these mean for our abilities to do things. And at Microsoft, we believe firmly that these tools, these technologies, can be a powerful force for good in our communities. Things like gathering data-driven insights from uh, the reams and reams of data that every organization has at their disposal, but frankly, most people don't know what to do with right now. We know we can do good, we know we need to do good with better jobs and skills and retraining opportunities so that we're empowering people with the skills they need for today and tomorrow. We know we can do good using technology to improve accessibility, to make government services or the community at large more accessible to people who might have a physical or developmental or even a language barrier in their way. These are the kinds of things that we're doing at Microsoft when we use our, our Microsoft Translator machine learning based voice to voice translation technology. Uh, to help people get access to city services. These are things that we're doing when we launched our Tech Jobs Academy retraining program for New Yorkers who don't have 
uh, skills, sorry, don't have uh, degrees, but do have intelligence so they can gain the skills they need to compete in the 21st century. We know we can use technology for disaster response. We know that all of you can think of a whole array of uses of technology that we can't, which is why it's so important that we created our technology and civic innovation team to be here in New York. This is what brought me here from the White House. This is what my entire team does every day. We wake up and we think about what are the issues that are affecting New Yorkers? What's the role technology can play to help? Who do we need to partner with to get positive change happening? And then we do it. And I feel really fortunate that we get to do that. At the same time, we need to think not just about what we can do, we need to think about what we should do. We need to think about ethics. Our CEO, Satya Nadella, recently spoke about algorithmic accountability, ensuring that we're not simply hard coding in the same biases that we've had in society for so long. There's a think tank in the Flatiron District called Data and Society, led by Jane and Boyd. They're doing great work around data and civil rights. Because when there are sentencing guidelines that come out of a black box, and that technology is proprietary, and we as a society can't see what's going into these decisions that are impacting whether or not somebody lives a free life, that's important. These are questions that we need to ask. We can't simply sit back and accept the good, the benefits that technology provides to our lives without asking hard questions about when we should use it and how. And the rate of change isn't slowing down, it's picking up. And this gets to Klaus Schwab's point in the Fourth Industrial Revolution. This one's happening faster than the prior three. So we can't wait. We need to have these conversations now, we need to make decisions now, we need to create new frameworks, we need to delve into these ethical questions. And now's the time to do it. When we talk about now, this is what's happening in Pittsburgh right now. Since the 1980s, healthcare has become a major employer in Pittsburgh. Carnegie Mellon University has become a world leader in robotics. And because of that, Uber came to Pittsburgh to set up their advanced technologies lab. This is a self-driving Uber. And if you're in Pittsburgh and you pull out your phone and you call up an Uber for a ride, there is a decent chance that you'll actually have a self-driving car come pick you up. Pittsburgh's mayor, Bill Peduto, took a ride and made a comment that Pittsburgh's an overnight success 30 years in the making. And when you think about the role that technology has played in the, the new Pittsburgh, because the old Pittsburgh was gone and wasn't coming back, things like this, this example of Uber is really important because you've got leadership that realized it had to make tough choices. And it chose to make investments where it could, and it chose to create a regulatory framework that was amenable to innovation. And when you look at Pittsburgh in relation to the rest of the Rust Belt cities, I think you can learn some lessons. And so where does this leave us? What are the, the takeaways I'd like you to, to step out of here with? One, cities are what we make them. It's the decisions that all of us make every day. It's not just the elected officials, it's also the NGOs, it's, it's academia, it's all of us. The choices we make define what our cities are. Secondly, technology can be a part of the solution. In fact, it should be a part of the solution. In the 21st century, policy only works if the technology works. That's something that we've learned over and over again. And finally, the future is what we make it. Having you all here in this room together is a great start. We've got people here who are passionate about making a positive impact in society and thinking about using their skills, whether those are skills they're gaining in business school and architecture, skills they learn on the job, but collectively, all together, that's when we can do the most. So I want to open this up with a fireside chat and welcome Andrew back out here and thank you for your time. Right. So Twitter handles are up here. Please tweet away. Nice things only. Um, so, Andrew, one of the things that I've witnessed in uh, my own life growing up in Pittsburgh was this massive shock that hit the city. At the same time, there are these chronic stresses that you talked about. 
When you think about stresses versus shocks, do you find one to be uh, a, a bigger issue, or are they just different? Right. That's a good question, and I, I think it, it's a good one that helps us think about a little bit how the cities respond. And I guess, let me just clarify, what was the shock? What was the shock? Uh, I would say the shock was the, the steel industry. And steel the, industry. The steel industry, the job loss, right. and no clear way to replace those. So, so you had mass unemployment. I would no doubt agree that that was, uh, as I've heard the mayor say, the death of the city, mm -hmm. and the 30 years in the making, and, and, but I would challenge, is that a shock? I think the, the change of the steel industry didn't happen overnight with sure. a giant storm. It happened over probably 30, 40 years. And what we'd love to think for cities is, how do they begin to recognize that they're in that trend and that that trend is kind of leading to death, which is, I think, you know, I imagine Pittsburgh in 1950, probably the quality of life was as high as it is anywhere in the country. Um, they probably couldn't recognize Except for that. probably lung quality. Except for lung quality. Yeah. Well, that. Maybe that affected where I lived in Philadelphia. But um, the, the, the idea, though, is how does the city begin to understand it's those stresses that actually can, in many ways, I think, as you're, you're right, sneak up on you. So one of the very first things we do with cities, and we were in Miami yesterday starting this conversation, is, is getting cities to understand what shocks are and how do they mean. And we kind of plot it on a graph, like likelihood that it will happen in severity. And when cities start thinking, when people start thinking about shocks, right, you, you're like, oh, wow, this is going to be horrible for my city. But what becomes really interesting is make them tape down where the shocks are going to happen, and it's always in the sev most severe corner. And then we start overlaying stresses. And very quickly, you start realizing that macroeconomic changes over time can have a much greater impact to Pittsburgh than a giant snowstorm, mm -hmm. than you know, the Steelers not winning the Super Bowl, or whatever the particular shock will be. Um, and how do you begin to think about that stress being an opportunity for you to start to make that change. And I think, I'd like to think about Pittsburgh. What had to happen over the last 30 years that the city actually did begin to manage its day-to-day -day stresses better and did emerge in a place where the mayor says it's an overnight success, which I think he would also argue it's not what it was and it's not what it will be, mm -hmm. and it still has a big goal to get there. Yeah, and I think one of the also the, the very fair points to make that maybe I didn't lay out in my kind of point-to-point -point description of Pittsburgh is that the last 30 years have been, a, it's been an interesting path and ride. It hasn't been um, a straight line. And there have been disruptions and, and other challenges that have arisen in, in Pittsburgh's history. Um, but it does seem like when you compare Pittsburgh to other cities that went through a similar situation in that similar time frame, it seems like the outcomes have been somewhat different. I think that's right. And I think, I'd like to think a lot of bit about why is that? And I, and I think one of the things you talked about, you know, Uber came to Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh was being successful. Right. But I also think Uber came to Pittsburgh because Mayor Peduto said, I want you in Pittsburgh, and how are we going to partner? And I guess, John, you, you've seen lots of technologies. You listed a bunch, and I know when we were, we've talked before, you're, you're familiar with so many great ideas that are out there, but even like open data or getting access to courses. I'm, that's just hard to do. And I guess what... What is it, how, does, how do the different people need to show up to create that partnership that can lead to Uber locating itself in a place that it probably never had heard of a couple of years ago? <laughs> I think they'd heard of Pittsburgh. But, uh, but I, I get your point. And from a regulatory a, lawsuit perspective. <laughs> it's, it's a fair point. And um, one of the things that we've realized in the work that I do every day at Microsoft is you, you can get so much more done through partnerships, but they're hard. And that's one of the reasons that people often don't do them, right? It's just, just kind of annoying. And, you know, I, I agree. You know, it's, it's hard when you're working with a bunch of other folks in different sectors of society with a different perspective. Um, it, you feel like it slows you down. You know, there's great research that's come out of Harvard Business School. Sorry, I know. Um, and it looked at, at diverse teams. And what was really interesting was, one, the finding that diverse teams outperform homogeneous teams. But what was also really interesting was that the diverse teams didn't think they were doing as well. And the homogeneous teams thought they were doing great, because they all agreed with each other. And I think it's the same thing when you create a partnership, that the process you're going through it day in, day out, it feels kind of tough. But at the end of the day, that's how you get the best results. And so I think when you look at what's happening in Pittsburgh, um, and we can also talk about other cities, we don't have to just talk about Pittsburgh. Um, when you look at what's happening there, you see the public sector and the private sector and academia
collectively working on these, these hard issues together. It's not, it's not that one sector is going to solve all the problems. It's not that there's one hero that's going to arrive. It's that everyone's bringing what they can to the table and then going from there. So thinking about a different city, right, in 19, 1997, there was a tremendous heat wave in Chicago and hundreds of people died. Mm -hmm. And they went and looked at the reasons for that and they found communities that were ne near communities, um, similar demographics, socioeconomic, had com very different rates of, um, um, of death and, and suffering. And they found it had to do with communities that kind of knew each other, had those, those touch points and felt comfortable working with each other, had a tremendous out outcome. And it's funny because that happened and then five years later, there was a tremendous amount of um, another heat wave in Europe where thousands of people died. And in Europe, they said, well, we never could have predicted it would have been so hot. And you're like, well, it just happened. And, and then here we are coming off of not today, but over the last you know, eight, ten weeks, we had summer. And we had a lot mm -hmm. of hot days. And New York City had a lot of heat days. And I think one of the things that's interesting about technology is you can leverage technology to begin to understand heat better. I know one of the projects um, we had talked about and we were working on was NYC, is that NYC Heat? Yeah, yeah, so Heat Seek NYC. So here's a solution that I feel like, th if you can talk a little bit about that, but I also think it might be a little interesting test case for like, how does something like this that makes a lot of sense happen, or maybe how does something like this makes a lot of sense actually not happen? Yeah, yeah, so uh, it's interesting. Heat Seek NYC actually deals with the opposite problem, which is when there isn't heat. So in the winter months, not sure if folks know, but there are actually laws on the books here in New York City that a landlord has to provide a certain level of heat in each apartment. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people in New York City who, where that doesn't happen, whether that's through um, something falling into disrepair and a simple mistake, or in other cases, sometimes intentional, where a landlord is not providing heat to a tenant. Typically, it's going to impact low-income tenants more than those who have means. So Heat Seek NYC is a really interesting creative solution of web-connected temperature sensors. Simple tamper-proof sensor box put into an apartment where you can then keep track of the temperature in an apartment. And uh, what's interesting is that this is a, a small group of 20-somethings, full disclosure, I'm on the board of, it, of directors, um, but it's a small group of 20-somethings who created this nonprofit because they simply just wanted to do something good for the city and people who needed, needed heat. And they've worked with the city, uh, Brooklyn Borough President, the mayor's office, and others. It's not a formal partnership, but making sure the city's aware of what they're doing, making sure that they can get feedback on what they're doing so that they can ensure that this is acceptable in housing court, for instance, the evidence that they're creating, the data they're creating is acceptable in housing court. And, um, and what they've seen, which is amazing to me, is that in many cases, you don't even need to go to housing court. Because when you send a letter to a landlord and you say, hey, just FYI, there are now these temperature sensors and a handful of apartments in your building, suddenly the heat goes up an average of five degrees, um, which is pretty incredible. And it's an example of a small, simple technology that's widely available actually have an impact in real people's lives. So when I think about this, I don't, you guys mind if I click back? Oh, sure. Let's, I want to just... If you don't mind, let's, I'm going to click back to just the framework for a second because I think this is a really interesting one. So John's talking about a basic need of heat. So you're way up there in that quadrant at the top, number one. And I think it's interesting if you think about what would normally happen if, if in, in New York City. So I spent a lot of time dealing with some aspect of heat provision and housing and owners of housing and doing reporting. It's interesting is... It's, a, it's, a, it's an event between someone who has probably low access and low time to deal with an issue and a, and a landlord that probably makes enough money and has the ability to kind of influence others. So immediately you're at odds with two entities and mm -hmm. here's this piece that you're trying to effectively empower this individual. And so it, it, it evens the playing field and changes probably how government has to show up to the conversation. But I think what's interesting about that is it allows, so now it becomes like a leadership and a partnership issue. So now you're kind of, you're influencing a different part of the system to have impact on how people would get basic needs. But I think what's really important, and maybe you, I know you've thought about this, is what are the, what are the I mean, the benefits of having heat are yeah. what? And it, I think it starts to become a much different conversation. It, it's, it's real. I mean, it's real. It, when you don't have heat in a home and your kid gets sick, 
one, your kid's sick, you have to go take them to the hospital. So now we're impacting livelihoods. So you're impacting livelihoods. We're impacting health. A person might lose their job because they can't show up uh, at work. The kid falls behind in school, makes it harder for them to succeed. And, and you're really, I mean, it's, it, can, it can perpetuate these generational um, uh, income gaps. And it, it's exactly what you have in the framework here. And I think what's interesting about that, and what I just want to raise it for folks, is, is now you've changed the conversation inside government and now government potentially shows up as a different type of partner. So now it's not a conversation about heat, it's a conversation about education. It's not just a conversation about education, it's a conversation about the health system. It's a conversation about economic prosperity, right? And it, it starts to have multiple entities coming together. And then if we start thinking about this from a different way and you start saying, well, what money is being spent in city government um, in some capacity on because um, kids are getting not, not going to school and mm -hmm. we're having to go to the health system and can we repurpose that money to pay for bit more heat sensors? And the answer is probably absolutely. You could probably pay yeah. for this program in and of itself and have a lot of savings. The challenge is those innovations require a lot of coordination and guts mm -hmm. by a lot of people um, and this gets us into the social impact space is how do you do that? And I would argue what we just described is, is easy to talk about up on the stage, but really hard to implement in person. And I think, you know, I don't know if you want to respond to that, but... Well, yeah, I would just say that I think one thing that's really interesting about this is that we are now touching on all of these different silos within government. And in a lot of cases, these groups haven't done a lot of talking to each other, and they haven't really shared data with one another a lot in the past. Uh, they haven't shared cards. They haven't shared cards, even. Uh, so, so moving beyond, st start with cards, let people know each other, but then moving on to things like open data where when we talk about governments opening up data, data that the taxpayers have paid for, collection of, um, obviously not personally identifiable information, we think usually about the benefits of the private sector, either researchers or entrepreneurs, but at the same time, huge benefits within government because now other agencies can get some insight into what's happening at their, at their sister and brother agencies. And so when we're looking at these problems that aren't contained simply to housing or to health or to education but involve all three, uh, there's, there's just this opening up of data, of information, and creating those networks is really important. And when you think, I want to talk about resilience yeah. officers for a second because you've got resilience officers in 50 cities now, is that right? About 50 out of the about 100. About 50 yep. out of the 100. And when, when you think about what they need to do and the variety of areas of, of life and of government that they need to, to touch and impact, is there a set of skills that you find necessary or what do you look for yeah. when you're identifying these people? Well, unfortunately, we've come to the conclusion that we're looking for unicorns. Um, and what that really means is they need to be someone who can be a and champion. And you found 50 of them, which is amazing. Well, we found 50 because what we realize is, is in many ways the unicorns exist, but not in individuals. Mm -hmm. And the unicorns exist within the city government, within the city population itself and it's the ability to recognize what are we trying to do and who can do that and how do we bring them to the table in a meaningful way. So we, we want someone who can be a champion, who can promote this concept of resilience, help people understand shocks and stresses, get up on stages like this and really work with people, but not just here but also go into community meetings and really meet with folks and, and help them understand the opportunity that we're talking about. You want someone who can understand complex systems thinking and apply it to the practicality of how do you actually get things done. Um, in a city from both a government, um, a private sector, a social sector perspective. Um, and then you want someone who can actually bring everyone together and, and drive them towards making meaningful change in their city. And I think there's planning components and there's implementation components. And I think that's where you start getting into the unicornness of mm -hmm. the idea. But what we try to do is we say to the cities, and this is really what we did, is, is once you realize that stresses are a key piece of this and you acknowledge that you have shocks, is how are you going to show up and how are you going to tackle these challenges? And if they're doing it well, and this is the difference between the first group of cities versus the third group of cities, is in Miami, you know, they don't have one chief resilience officer. They actually are going to have three. And they're going to work at the county level, the city of Miami level, and the beaches are all going to work. And they're going to work in a coordinated way that's going to work beyond infrastructure, beyond social and try to bring all of their different components together in a unique way. And that's the only way that cities will be successful is mm -hmm. getting all the owners of these systems to, to actually realize that they're part of a bigger system and that they have a really important role. So um, I think 
you know, again, the, the, the longest chief resilience officer has been around for about two years, so I think who they'll be and how they're going to be successful and how cities integrate this is, is still a tale we're writing. But um, I think the things they need to do is lead that kind of change. And I think if they can't understand data, they at least need to know that data is important, mm -hmm. and they need to make sure the people that own the data can show up in a way that, that um, can be informative and meaningful. So um, that was actually my next question, was how these resilience officers interface with technologists uh, so that they, they have these 21st century tools yeah. at their disposal. So um, data is a really hard one for cities to do. And I think as you were talking, John, I don't know if anyone else thought this is like, in one level we're talking about the future that could happen today. It's happening to a system that's real today, but it's created from the past. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that made sense, but, um, and the question that I always ask myself and when I was in government, you know, you'd be sitting in front of someone who has amazing technology, and I'd be looking back at saying, okay, well, this is where I am today, and this is a great place where I'd like to go. I think the piece that we need to work on a lot, and the technologists need to be a part of this, and, and the folks who own the current systems need to be a part owner of this, it's not how you just adopt a new program that can change the system overnight, although sometimes that happens and that can be great. But I think it's a question of what are those incremental steps that we can take, not on our pathway to SMART, so, right, in many ways, you know, if you think about college, you have to go to school for 18 or so years to earn a degree. How do we get cities to be not smart first? How do they become less dumb or a little less stupid? And how do they start growing to be smart? Right. And I think if you think about some of the challenges I, I think you maybe tinkered with, it's inspiring them but yet getting them to take those baby steps. So the real change here isn't that there's technology in houses that help understand when there's heat. The real change here is that kids are going to school with higher quality of life and they're getting jobs and opportunities to exist in a society that's more meaningful. And I think that's a much larger scale. So I think how do we help people do that and how do we help meet cities and the partners that cities have, the nonprofits and the communities where they are so that they can move forward at the right step so that we get the, the giant change that we're looking for. Yeah, you and, I, that? I, and I think the point about how do you get the giant change, lots of little changes. How do you eat an elephant? You shouldn't eat elephants, that's the answer. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we've realized is it's not just about technologies specifically, but it's about the, the culture and the how you get somewhere. And we've been able to learn a lot of lessons from the tech sector, from the startup community, and bring those into other parts of society like government, and to get more iterative progress going. Um, one example is the Tech Jobs Academy program that we launched in collaboration and partnership with the Mayor's Tech Talent Pipeline and City Tech, a community college in downtown Brooklyn, where it's a framework for how to spend workforce training dollars that are already being spent, but to make sure they're being spent on what industry actually is hiring for right now. And it's set up in a way that it doesn't become out of date like so many curricula do. It stays up to date because we're constantly checking in with industry to find out what they need. So every six or 12 months, we can make those changes. So again, creating those feedback loops, being responsive and taking an iterative approach to how you actually try to get to that great, yeah. huge impact. And that's great. And that's something that you know, we didn't really have time to share today. Is It's one thing to have a framework, but I think it's the qualities in which you do your work that begin to make it resilient. And, and as John was just describing, that program and training requires an integrated approach that's going to you know, allow multiple people to come together and, and help support each other. Uh, it's inclusive because it's focusing on different populations and bringing them to access to opportunities they might not have, as well as places that are going to need people to work in and bringing them to where the job market is. But the idea of creating a very flexible and robust academic kind of curriculum that effectively over 18 months will not look like it did 18 months ago mm -hmm. um, is kind of unheard of in how, we, how our normal society is structured. And it's the ability of bringing this new type of thinking into these these static systems, and I love your point of we're leveraging money that's already there, we're just going to use it to do something that it sh was supposed to be doing, but the way it did it was outdated. And if you think about a lot of the solutions that we have out there, and I think it's Uber's an interesting one, is Uber's getting challenged by many different uh, governments because it's challenging um, long-standing practices. And I think one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is the long-standing practice what we're trying to perpetuate or, is, or have we lost our way and we should be supporting the end goal that we've always had. So if the goal is for people to have jobs and we believe education is a pathway to jobs, then what's the way we do education? Um, I think it's a good question to ask. 
and what are the resources we have and how can we leverage them differently. And I think that's really hard. And I think you're right, the government's a good partner there, but it's hard to find the right people in government because a lot of times their job is keeping the lights on and making sure the classroom at least functions, not how to, what's the curriculum and how do you change that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we are near time, but to wrap up this conversation, I think we should leave you with a few parting thoughts. And one is that you're going to hear from a lot of people about a lot of really pressing issues today. You're going to hear about income inequality, labor market stresses. Um, and at the end of the day, because governments are so under-resourced and because they're focused on keeping the lights on, it's going to be the people in this room who actually help move the ball forward on a lot of these big questions of 2016 that are going to still be big questions in 2017, and 2018, and 2020. Um, but there's no time to start like the present. So I think this event, having all of you here today, is a fantastic start. And I would just encourage you to keep it going after today. Don't make this just a conference. Make this the start of something. Identify issues that you hear about today. Meet the people here, whether they're in the crowd with you or they're up on stage. And, and figure out what role you can play. Because at the end of the day, the way we're going to make the cities of tomorrow, the way we're going to empower the next generation of great American cities and global cities, it's through all of us, through an all-hands-on-deck effort. So with that, uh, any parting thoughts? I think the one thing that feeds right into what you said, John, is, is we talked about it's, it's how do you take that hard path of creating those right partnerships that will lead to the giant successes that we're all striving for and recognizing that your, your thinking doesn't just impact one component and the easy way might not be the, the, the best way. And challenge your... Your, your folks with it, whether the businesses, the communities, the individuals, or government, or whoever you're working with, to show up and, and do the hard work with you so that you can have that lasting impact. So um, I appreciate the time, and uh, this was a really exciting conversation, John. Absolutely. Thanks for being here, Andrew, and I hope everyone has a fantastic day.